Hi, very good morning. I'm Dr. Janak Patel. Today, I'll be talking on one of the very interesting topic, how you approach to a person of hypertension. So, before we start, I would like to say that I am a general physician. I'm not a cardiologist, but whatever I know, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. So approach to hypertension, you know very well. To detect an hypertension, it is very easy. But good number of time, we'll show you one slide where you can see that almost 50% of the people who are hypertensive are not detected. So we should make a very good attempt to identify the person who is suffering from hypertension. And that will be possible if you suspect a person is having hypertension and you make a proper diagnosis by taking a good blood pressure recording. Now we know that this is deadly. Why it is deadly? Because hypertension produces a lot of complications. And when it is not detected, not treated, the complications incidence are more, which will have a high mortality and morbidity. You know all these persons, they are also deadly. These are all deadly for India. So, we should try to identify. So, sorry, here R is missing. So, there are other deadly materials also, like we call hyperlipidemia and diabetes. So, we call deadly trio. So, that particular thing, if you identify them early, you will be able to give a very good result. It will reduce mortality as well as morbidity. There are a lot of guidelines which are being there, including even Indian Heart Association guidelines. But all those guidelines are to guide you and you have to treat the patient as a whole, not the figures. Yes, we always say Mera Bharat Mahan because in spite of all this, still India is doing well. Now, you know these two famous people. They give a very nice speech. So my speech may not be like these two people. But at the same time, it is not like these people also. My speech will not be like any one of this. I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. I'll talk facts of what is there in hypertension, how you do, how you approach, etc. But not like these people who does not talk what is the facts. We'll be talking on introduction, classification, management, and complications. Now, you say a person is hypertensive when there is a persistent elevation of resting arterial blood pressure more than 140 by 90. Not on a single reading, on three separate occasions. This is very important. Blood pressure has to be more than 140 by 90 and it has to be on three separate occasions, not 5-10 minutes interval. So, it has to be persistent elevation and it has to be on a three separate occasion and more than 140 by 90. Now, there are some terminology which we utilize. I will be going one by one. Primary means when the etiology of this hypertension, if I cannot identify by all possible investigation, I will say that as a primary or idiopathy. But atherosclerosis is one of the cause for that primary hypertension. While secondary, secondary means there is some definite cause for hypertension. Say as for example, renal, endocrine, arterial disease during pregnancy, etc. So those are called secondary. We'll be talking separately of all those conditions also. There is one another term called as a resistant hypertension. This is only on treatment. So when you give a treatment and in treatment, there are three minimum drugs which you have given in a full therapeutic dose. And one of those three is diuretic. In spite of using all in optimum doses, including diuretics, and person 
is still having hypertension persistent hypertension we'll call that as a resistant hypertension if only systolic is elevated diastolic is normal say as for example 190 by 70 we call that as isolated systolic hypertension if only diastolic is elevated systolic is normal 130 by 90 130 by 100 it is isolated diastolic hypertension isolated systolic hypertension is very common in old individual with atherosclerosis while in a young individual who has got mark arterial resistance they have got isolated diastolic hypertension when both are elevated systolic as well as diastolic they call it a systolic diastolic hypertension but this particular terminology is nowadays not utilized only we utilize isolated systolic hypertension now suppose if the blood pressure is elevated so high where it gives rise to possibility of producing damage to the target organs or already person is having a symptoms of target organ damage we call that as a hypertensive crisis now if a person has got symptoms and signs suggestive of a involvement of target organs we call that as a hypertensive emergency and if there are no symptom signs but he is having a tendency or a threat that there may be a damage to the target organ we call that as urgency both together if you are not able to clearly identify we call that as a crisis there is one another terminology we utilize white coat hypertension mask hypertension and much white coat means when the person goes to a clinic for measurement of blood pressure blood pressure recorded on a clinic blood pressure monitoring is high and when he goes to home in a home blood pressure monitoring it is normal this is probably because of anxiety or what we call as excitement and that produces white coat hypertension this may not require any treatment and if you convince the person give a little psychotherapy mental relaxation exercise person may not need any one of those treatment for hypertension while a mask hypertension means when the person goes to a clinic blood pressure recorded is normal in a home blood pressure monitoring or in a ambulatory blood pressure monitoring you record a blood pressure quite frequently in a early morning it is high this is called mask hypertension this particular people are not detected very commonly and they can end up with a morbidity as well as mortality and this person has to be treated <coughs> sorry much means a mask hypertension when it is uncontrolled mask u for un c for control mask uncontrolled hypertension is called as a mask uncontrolled hypertension <coughs> it is in short form called as a much depending upon the blood pressure recording all this will be possible mask hypertension much white coat hypertension labile stable unstable accelerated if you do what we call as a ambulatory blood pressure monitoring what is there in the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring you put an instrument at the belt and it goes on recording your blood pressure for 24 hours so it records multiple recording continuously whenever you are at sleep or you are working or you are ambulatory it goes on recording your blood pressure so if out of 10 recording say 7 or 8 are normal occasionally one or two are elevated then you call that as labile hypertension so almost 80 to 90% records are normal and occasionally one or two records are elevated we call labile all blood pressure are same and all are elevated say 140 by 90 140 by 90 140 by 90 we call that as a stable all are elevated but they go on fluctuating all are more than 140 by 90 140 by 90 150 by 100 160 by 100 140 by 90 it is fluctuating it is not stable then we call that is unstable but say blood pressure goes on rising 
140 by 90, 150 by 100, 160 by 100, 170 by 110, 180 by 120, 190 by 130. So that is called accelerated hypertension. So these are some of the terms which are very commonly being utilized. There is com something called as a pseudo hypertension and pseudo resistant hypertension. Now, pseudo hypertension and pseudo resistant hypertension, we usually create, it is created by a nurse or by a person who is measuring a blood pressure. It is because of the false recording of a blood pressure. As well as good number of time, it is by a faulty instruments also. So, that is called pseudo resistant hypertension or pseudo hypertension. When you record properly, your instrument is good, your method of recording is good, we call it a true hypertension. There is something, there is also one term utilized is apparent hypertension. You feel he is hypertensive, but he may not be hypertensive. Now, according to the figure and latest guidelines, there are three common words utilized. Elevated hypertension, grade 1, grade 2. Elevated means 135 by 85 is called as elevated hypertension. 140-90 is called as a grade 1. And more than 160, 100 is called as grade 2. There were previous figures which were utilized in what we call as different guidelines which were there. Now those particular are being replaced by latest guidelines. There are Indian guidelines also. Indian guidelines also divides into only three. Elevated hypertension, grade 1, grade 2. Grade 1, grade 2. This is, if a blood pressure record, what you record during systole of cardiac cycle, we call systolic blood pressure. If you are recording a blood pressure during a diastolic period of a cardiac cycle, it is called diastolic blood pressure. And mean arterial pressure means systolic plus twice diastolic blood pressure divided by 3. So that will give you a mean arterial pressure. And if you put a catheter, in an artery and record a blood pressure at that level, it is called as a mean aortic pressure. So, if you put the catheter in a pulmonary artery, it will be a mean pulmonary arterial pressure. So, depending upon that, you use a terminology. Now, this is one which we usually follow. If in office you record a blood pressure and systolic is more than 140, diastolic more than 90, we call as a hypertension. In an ambulatory recording, during a daytime, if you record 135 by 85, he is labeled as hypertensive. In a night time, in an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, 120 by 70 will be considered as hypertensive. And mean blood pressure, 130 by 80 is also considered as hypertensive. In a home blood pressure monitoring, 135 by 85 is considered as hypertensive. So these are the figures which are being utilized for labeling a person to be hypertensive. But by and large, we say that any time, if it is more than 140 by 90, the person is labeled as hypertension. But it should be in a three separate occasions. This is what we call as a home blood pressure monitoring, daytime monitoring, nighttime monitoring, and 24 hours average recording. So stage one in ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, 125 by 75, and stage two, 130 by 80 and some people label this as a stage 2 and 140 by 90 is labeled as stage 1. So depending upon which guidelines you are following, you can follow according to that. But there are certain targets which are being there. 140 by 90 is considered as definitely hypertensive, whether it is having a high cardiovascular risk factor or low cardiovascular risk factor. High means more than 10%. Low means less than 10 percent or age more than 65 to 80 or more than 80. Any one of this group, you require a target to be less than 130 by 80. So basic, you may follow whatever criteria you follow. But if a person is diabetic, it has to be less than 130 by 80. If a person has got severe stroke, it has to be 130 by 80. CKD also 130 by 80. In a coronary artery disease what called ischemic heart disease, 120 by 80. And in a heart failure again, 120 by 80. So 
basically your target should be 130 by 80 and in case of ischemic heart disease and a failure it should be less than 120 by 80 so these are the target goals this is another slide which shows you what should be your blood pressure threshold and what should be your goal in which person whatever was given before same thing is mentioned here so try to maintain this target these are the goal so you bring down to this particular level now the commonest causes of resistant hypertension is one very very common in india is because of high sodium intake we call s sodium steroid where is that steroid and nsaid yes also sometime oral contraceptive pills also can add what we call as resistant hypertension so steroid nsaid oral contraceptive pills and sodium becomes very very high risk for producing resistant hypertension now whenever you are giving a diuretic therapy if it is given in a sub therapeutic dose it is also one of the factor which can produce resistant hypertension excess of alcohol intake there are some drugs which are available on otc counter particularly herbal preparation good number of time ayurvedic and herbal preparation they contain steroids so that can also end up with resistant hypertension if a person is having secondary cause and you are not diagnosed and you are treating as a primary then also person can end up with a resistant hypertension good number of time on the side of the patient he is not adherent to the treatment he goes on changing the dose he decreases the dose he stops the medicine in between etc can also produce white coat hypertension pseudo hypertension as well as improper recording can also end up with a resistant hypertension another very common group we call is a oac obstructive sleep apnea panic disorders hyperaldosteronism anxiety all this can add up into resistant hypertension so try to rule out this and then only add the additional drug so whenever you come across a person in whom you have given a three drugs one of them is diuretic and still blood pressure is not under control you try to rule out all this condition and then only add a fourth drug and keep that thing in mind proper blood pressure measurement sodium diuretic steroid oral contraceptive pills sympathomimetic drugs otc products which is herbal preparation ayurvedic preparation containing good quantity of steroids alcohol intake secondary hypertension non adherence to treatment as well as white coat hypertension mask hypertension etc can be hyperaldosteronism pseudo hypertension osa anxiety panic disorder can be a cause of resistant hypertension keep that thing in mind what is pseudo resistant pseudo resistance means poorly controlled hypertension that appears to be resistant to the treatment but actually it is attributed to these factors and there are very common factors these are some of the common factors white coat hypertension poor adherence suboptimal antihypertensive treatment poor adherence to antihypertensive treatment dietary lifestyles etc that is sodium intake oral contraceptive pills all those medicines they are taking and inaccurate measurements so these are the causes for pseudo resistance or we call pseudo hypertension the commonest etiology as far as primary or we call essential or we call idiopathic that accounts for 94 to 95% of the cases of hypertension so remaining 5% are secondary of that 5% 90% of this 5% 90% is renal in which major causes are renal parenchymal and renovascular renovascular renal artery stenosis may be congenital fibrodysplasia or may be atherosclerosis while renal parenchymal most common acute glomerulonephritis chronic glomerulonephritis chronic pyelonephritis and chronic disorders of kidney like ckd due to diabetes and other causes polycystic kidney etc those will be in a renal parenchymal disease 
Among endocrinal, the most common is primary hyperaldosteronism, pheochromocytoma, and Cushing's. Very rarely acromegaly. In vascular, coarctation of aorta, aorta arthritis, etc. Among drugs, NSAID, steroids, oral contraceptive pills, and once in a while, cyclosporin. In miscellaneous, this is now coming up. This is a very, very common cause. That is, we call it obstructive sleep apnea. So, these are the common conditions which can produce secondary hypertension group. But they are accounting for only 5%. And out of that 5%, 90% of that 5% is renal. And another big group is endocrine. So, renal and endocrine accounts for almost 95% of or we can call 99% of that secondary groups. Rest is vascular drugs miscellaneous group. Among those idiopathic group, the risk factors are modifiable risk factor or we call controllable risk factor. This is a big list. You should try to go through all this list. Non-modifiable like age, sex, family history, race, hereditary, etc. I am not going into detail regarding this. At your leisure time, you can go through that. We call as a risk factor for atherosclerosis. So you can go through at leisure time. Modifiable, non-modifiable. Most common, obesity, anxiety, anger, your food habits. So sedentary lifestyle, diet, anxiety, stress, anger, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, obesity. All these are risk factors. And these are all the causes of secondary. This is little bit in more detail. You can go through at leisure time what we have not mentioned before. Some of those cases are res responsible, say like cocaine, etc. In metabolic, diabetes, toxemia of pregnancy, and in pregnancy, there are also there are other causes in neurogenic, raise intracranial pressure. So go through at your leisure time. This is renal parenchymal. This is renal artery stenosis. Renal artery stenosis. These are renal parenchymal. This is polycystic disease. And most common cause is acute glomerulonephritis. This is Cushing. This is obesity and obstructive sleep apnea. This is hyperaldosteronism. Cushing, hyperaldosteronism, cardiometabolic syndrome, and obstructive sleep apnea group. In pregnancy, you can come across what we call as a health syndrome, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, low platelet. And also you can come across preeclampsia, eclampsia. Preeclampsia is proteinuria with edema, hypertension after 20 weeks of pregnancy. And eclampsia is preeclampsia with seizures. When you come across this particular group, the most important part is a blood pressure recording. Have a proper blood pressure recording, fundus examination, urine analysis, CBC, risk factors, and target organs examinations. Investigation for target organ damage. Investigation for risk factors. For risk factor, fasting lipid profile, uric acid, and you go for a fasting glucose and GTT, or we call prospendium. Blood chemistry, you can go for sodium, potassium, and creatinine. You find out kidneys affected or not in target organs, as well as it will help you to identify whether the person has got previous kidney damage. Potassium will help to identify hyperaldosteronism and other disorders like cosing etc endocrine disorders even it will be abnormal in a case of a CKD so try to identify all those and have a 12 lead ECG to find out effect of hypertension on cardiovascular system these are the investigation which are done for identifying asymptomatic organ damage which is good number of time even present in a person with a prehypertensive. So, pulse pressure measurements, ECG, if ECG is showing LVH, echocardiography is showing you LVH, 
carotid wall thickness we call is a carotid intima thickness cimt carotid intima media thickness you try to identify by intravascular ultrasound carotid femoral pulse wave velocity ankle brachial index these are some of the condition which will be you will be able to pick up a person with a early atherosclerosis in a ckd egfr calculation will help you a lot and microalbuminuria try to calculate all this it will help you to give you a early indication that person is getting a damage because of hypertension and you will be able to pick up pre hypertensive groups whenever you measure a blood pressure there are non invasive measures and invasive invasive are usually not utilized they are mainly done in a icu or in a critical care unit you have to put a probe or you have to put a catheter into aorta and measure the mean aortic pressure or you put a probe into pulmonary artery and measure the mean pulmonary arterial pressure a non invasive technique is we call is a by sphygmomanometer by a sphygmomanometer you measure what we call as a home blood pressure monitoring office blood pressure monitoring and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring usually what we use is auscultatory method and the commonest instrument which is utilized is a mercury instrument and another common instrument which is utilized is aneroid yes you can also utilize a digital instrument you can measure a blood pressure by palpatory method or oscillatory method these are not proper but before doing a auscultatory method always do a palpatory method that will help you to identify auscultatory gap so try to identify that whenever you measure the blood pressure best instrument is a mercury blood pressure instrument measure in a office measure at home measure at ambulatory by and large in a office we commonly utilize mercury instrument aneroid or we call as a digital office blood pressure monitoring or we call clinical blood pressure monitoring home blood pressure monitoring instruments are usually digital they are rarely what we call is a mercury or aneroid by and large they use digital in ambulatory also they are digital and in a ambulatory oscillatory blood pressure monitoring this is there is a special instrument which measures by means of oscillations and that is a best instrument available it is a costly instrument but you it is the best method of measuring a blood pressure this blood pressure you can measure in supine posture that is the best while ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is usually measured in a sitting posture home blood pressure monitoring will be also done by and large in a sitting posture by and large in a office also majority of people they do a blood pressure monitoring in a sitting posture but ideal is supine posture whenever you want to identify differentiate a postural hypertension you measure the difference between supine supine and sitting in supine it will be high when a person stands up and if there is a fall of blood pressure more than 20 mm of systolic blood pressure you will label that as a postural hypertension and that is the mode in which you can diagnose the person of orthostatic hypertension or we call postural hypertension measure that way first time when the person comes to you measure the blood pressure in both upper arm it will help you to rule out atherosclerosis coarctation of aorta arch of aorta aneurysm atherosclerosis in the subclavian arteries etc it will help you to differentiate that and once in a while you will be also be able to pick up a condition in a thoracic aorta if you measure the blood pressure in upper arm and lower limb so when you measure the blood pressure in upper arm and lower limb and compare the two you will be able to differentiate arch of aorta and thoracic aorta disorders like aneurysm coarctation atherosclerosis occlusions etc and even in a case of a takayasu disease another mode of taking a blood pressure is at a wrist and that is by a digital instrument which is called as, which is like a wrist watch you can take a blood pressure at ankle and wrist and identify what we call is a ankle brachial index 
and that may be one of the way in which you can identify an early atherosclerosis there are some instrument which you put a finger in that particular and that will give you a blood pressure recording it is not an accurate but can be a rough estimation lower limb blood pressure monitoring is good number of time helpful to differentiate some of the condition which are there in a thoracic aorta if you come across a lower lower limb blood pressure which is very very high and there is a very wide pulse pressure that is called as a hills sign and there is an another sign we call as a menes sign so this is positive in case of an what we call as a aortic regurgitation so blood pressure monitoring in different situations that is position office home ambulatory will help you to differentiate mask hypertension white coat hypertension stable unstable labile accelerated etc so all those can be identified if you use ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring based by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring because this will give you a multiple readings so these are all the different methods by which you try to identify and whenever you are measuring always try to measure a blood pressure in a right upper extremity first time in both extremities ambulatory ankle brachial index should be measured in a person in whom you are suspecting atherosclerosis lower limb i already told you in which condition you try to measure supine sitting why you measure in supine sitting all those and in an erect posture whenever you measure a blood pressure you must take up precaution instrument should be properly calibrated that should be of a best quality and as far as possible mercury is the best if not available you can use digital but that should be a best and calibrated instrument avoid smoking caffeine like tea coffee exercise minimum 30 minutes before measuring a blood pressure person should empty out his bladder sit quietly for at least minimum 5 minutes before measurements and during that particular time should remain still during the measurements that should be a good support to the limb while you are measuring a blood pressure bp cup should be at the level of the heart level and the base of the mercury instrument should be at the level of the heart the cup size should be cup size should be according to the size of the arm it should cover up 80% of the arm circumference and it should be adequate enough to cover up the major part of the upper arm the lower border of the bp cup should be at least minimum two finger above the cubital fossa don't take the measurements with the clothes on this is the major drawback which is being done measure the blood pressure in both arms and use the higher readings take two or three measurements at two or three separate occasions and then only label the person as hypertensive same thing is mentioned what are the precaution you should take and when you lower the pressure in the cup lower it very very gradually 2 mm per second don't lower it very fast it will give you a false interpretation and whenever you elevate the blood pressure in a bp cup it should be above the palpitatory systolic blood pressure or at least about 200 or more than even 200 and 10 so try to do that always use a office blood pressure monitoring and in case of a doubt have a ambulatory or a home blood pressure monitoring it will help you to rule out mask hypertension white coat hypertension and labile stable unstable accelerated etc it will help you to differentiate those this is all the indications of home blood pressure monitoring and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring you can go through you at your leisure time suspicion of white coat suspicion of a mask hypertension white coat hypertension effects then you can identify some of the condition disc quadrants then resistant hypertension etc you try to go through all this list this is the difference between ambulatory home blood pressure clinical what is the best based is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring but go through at your leisure time i am skipping over that 
and this is how you identify i have already mentioned how you identify the mask hypertension how you identify the white coat hypertension so office isolated clinic blood pressure monitoring and white coat hypertension so try to office is also called as a white coat hypertension or isolated clinic hypertension also this is ankle brachial index you measure the blood pressure at radial and you measure the blood pressure at ankle so by measuring that you try to identify abi index and if abi index is becoming less than 0.9 it is in favor of atherosclerosis early atherosclerosis this i already discussed before what is the importance of blood pressure monitoring in lower limb and what is the difference between upper limb lower limb what is the difference between the two sides right upper limb and left upper limb so all those conditions now step 1 confirm that person is hypertensive so confirmation is only by blood pressure recording we have already mentioned how you how accurately you measure the blood pressure history and symptoms will help you to suspect primary and secondary and do physical examination cardiovascular system examination etc depending upon what is your suspicion you should do ambulatory home office or clinical blood pressure monitoring best is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring try to measure by that it will help you to identify many conditions after measuring that depending upon the figure we put them into different stages pre hypertensive stage 1 stage 2 depending upon the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring labile stable unstable accelerated mask hypertension white coat hypertension etc and depending upon the figure isolated systolic diastolic systolic diastolic and then with the history and other investigation we call compelling indications like diabetes ckd pregnancy complicated conditions endocrine disorders all those conditions ischemic heart disease congestive heart failure so to find out the compelling indication and primary or secondary you will have to undergo investigation we have already mentioned before what investigation you do also do the investigation to find out the risk factors do the investigation to find out the target organ damage like cardiovascular system renal eye peripheral arterial disease brain etc also in case of a clinical symptoms presence of symptoms and if you are suspicion of a hypertensive crisis try to identify whether it is urgency or emergency because in emergency and urgency you need a treatment immediately you have to start the treatment immediately and in case of emergency you require a iv therapy and sometime also in a case of urgency also you might need a injectable and if a person does not have a hypertensive emergency maybe stage wise anything maybe stage 1 stage 2 maybe in any one of this group or compelling indications or maybe primary or secondary you start a treatment that is total lifestyle changes or a drug we call as a abcd depending upon the compelling indications etc you decide which drug will be better will be going through all those now one by one so also identify primary or secondary and then decide what drugs you want to this is what we have given in a previous slide same thing is mentioned use this figure for putting them into a group diagnostic workup cardiovascular system risk factor workup and assess the identification of the cause primary or secondary and in secondary what are the etiology try to work up that and entire thing is mentioned here what we have mentioned before what we have discussed before is mentioned here so try to identify that and then only decide regarding a treatment you know very well that hypertensive treatment has been necessary or it is absolutely necessary in primary or secondary it is whether it is primary or secondary and it is always a lifelong disease so it has to be for life long yes in case of secondary there are some treatable cause you treat those cause it is reversible 
and person may not require a further treatment. You know, blood pressure can be controlled but cannot be cured. This should be the thing which should be explained to the person. And we do have a blood pressure control to reduce the risk factor for stroke, MI, congestive heart failure, CKD, etc. Contraindication is only one. That is, if a person is hypotensive or in a short stage, maybe normal volumic, maybe hypovolemic. It is contraindication. And if any person who is sensitive or he has developed a complications secondary to a drugs, that drug should not be used. You can use the another drug. So there is no specific contraindication. But contraindication for a specific drug, if a person is sensitive or he gets a side effects or toxicity. So again, we call non-pharmacological is a lifestyle modification and pharmacological is ABCD and other drugs which is for risk factors like statin, aspirin, clopidogrel, etc. And surgical treatment is mainly required in a secondary groups, say for renal artery stenosis, pheochromocytoma, coarctation of aorta, eclampsia, etc. In eclampsia, say termination of pregnancy, in coarctation, dilatation with stenting, pheochromocytoma, surgical removal, renal artery stenosis, stenting or surgical repair of a renal artery. So these are those particular. And in case of a resistant hypertension, renal degeneration, which can be open or by means of a catheter. So these are some of the procedure. And in this condition, it is reversible. Or we can call, you can have a cure sometimes in this condition. Otherwise, basic is non-pharmacological lifestyle modification and pharmacological is a drugs. So non-pharmacological, pharmacological, surgical treatment and treatment for resistant hypertension. So lifestyle modification, antihypertensive treatment supported by lipid lowering, diabetes control, etc. And antiplatelets becomes the supportive line of treatment. A healthy meal is the first thing in a total lifestyle modification. This is an unhealthy meal. You should not have this unhealthy meal. Whenever you do a very nice lifestyle modification like weight reduction, if you reduce more than 10 kg, you can reduce your blood pressure from 5 to 20 millimeter. If you do a DES dietary course, we call it as a dietary approach to stop hypertension. It is called DESH. It can reduce your blood pressure from 8 to 14 millimeter. Sodium restriction can reduce from 2 to 8. Physical activity and mental stress reduction can reduce from 4 to 9. Alcohol restriction 2 to 4. When you put all this together, it can reduce from 20 to 55 millimeter of mercury. And this is a very, very good without any drugs, without any side effects. So if any person who does a rigid lifestyle modification can reduce up to 20 to 55 millimeter of mercury in systolic blood pressure. So you can see a very good effect of all these things. But this person is doing a treadmill, but treadmill is done by a dog. Is not doing an exercise. He is having a food package, which is from McDonald's. He is having a Coke. All these are worst for hypertension. So try to avoid all those things. When you go to the market and you go for purchasing one item, but you see a lot of items, you get confused. So we also get confused whenever. There are more than 200 to 300 different types of antihypertensive drugs, but we have to select only one. So while selecting one from 200 to 300 items, it becomes very difficult. So selecting an ideal antihypertensive becomes very, very difficult. So it is very difficult what to select. So it is same like this person when he's having lot of ladders and he wants to see on that side. He doesn't utilize any one of this. He's confused. So it happens, you have got many resources. So during many resources, it becomes a difficult matter to selection. So always use the best, but select properly. And while selection, you, it is like selecting a life partner. You want a life partner which should be long acting for 24 hours. That is, you select a drug which is having a 24 hours action, 
which improves quality of life. It should be from a very good quality, means from a standard pharmaceutical company, relatively cheap. This is very difficult. If you want a good quality, they are usually expensive. But good quality with a low price are the best drugs because it can be av available for any person. It should be easily available in any corner of the country. It should be powerful and effective and as effective for 24 hours. At the same time, we know that no one is Sarvagun Sampan. We want 36 gun in one person. Same way, we want all these things in one drug, which is not possible. Simultaneously, drug should be, because we have got only one choice. Drug should have no side effects, no toxicity, no interaction, not possible. Hence, we are having 200 to 300 different types of drugs. But if any drug which is having a good blood pressure control, having a little improvement in quality of life, it is relatively cheap, easily available, powerful and effective, and also having a pleiotropic effect on cardiovascular system, on lipids, on kidney, we call nephroprotective. It is a base drug. Try to select that. And drug should block RAS system or we call it should protect your target organs. If that drug is available, that is the wonderful drug. We know that we divide into four groups, A, B, C, D. It is not that anybody can dance. We will have a part one, part two, Later on, some year, you will come across part 3, part 4, part 5, etc. But we use this word A for ARB, ACE inhibitor, B for beta blocker, C for calcium channel blocker, D for diuretics. And first, we have got an another group we call as a central reacting or vasodilator group and miscellaneous. So, first choice is always ARB, ACE inhibitor. But C comes before B. So, we call second choice is CCB. D is before B, that is diuretic is the third choice. And fourth choice is beta blocker. And fifth choice is centrally acting or vasodilators. So vasodilators and centrally acting drugs comes in a fifth drugs. And this is the mechanism of action. I don't go into detail. A drug which is acting at this level is called centrally acting drugs. The drug which is acting here is vasodilators. And one of the very good vasodilator is sent CCB and there are also what does not belong to CCB. They are also vasodilators. There are drugs which is acting on a heart. We call it a cardio selective and most common is beta blocker and there are CCB which is acting on the heart level and which acts at a RAS level. We call it the ACE inhibitor ARB and diuretics which is acting at the level of the kidney on the loop, loop of inlays and distal convoluted tubule. All these are where they are acting. So, if you select a drug which is acting at the different areas, say centrally acting drugs with beta blocker, centrally acting drugs with ACE inhibitor ARB, ACE inhibitor with diuretics, they are acting at a different level, you get an additive effect. But if you use a drug which is acting at the same level, it does not improve the effects. So, try to identify. So, you have got a Another group we call as a renin inhibitor, which will be acting at this level. It will inhibit the renin and does not allow the angiotensin to be converted into angiotensin 1. And this is ACE inhibitor will be acting, not allowing the angiotensin 1 to be converted into angiotensin 2. Aldosterone antagonist is acting at the level of aldosterone. And ARB is acting at the level of 81 receptors. So this is the site where it is acting and you know what will be the benefit, what will be the advantage, what will be the disadvantage. We are going through the common groups now. ACE inhibitor or ARB. I am talking about ACE inhibitor. All these other things remains common for ARB also. In ACE inhibitor, there are drugs name. I am giving the basic compound. Captopril, enalapril, lisinopril, remilpril, benapril, fosinopril and plus there are many others. Indication, hypertension with congestive heart failure, ischemic heart disease, 
cerebrovascular disease, coronary artery disease, post MI, diabetes mellitus, it is a first drug of choice. In SCKD, it can be used if GFR is up to 50. Now, some people say that you can use up to even 30, but less than 30, don't use ARB or ACE inhibitor. First line of drug of choice in case of hypertension with these groups or it can be utilized with CCB, beta blocker or diuretic. You can combine with any. Yes. Also in case of a person with hyperlipidemia, you can use some benefits, particularly with telmisertan. It is having a pleiotropic effect. In a diabetic nephropathy or a person with diabetes, it prevents proteinuria or to, it reduces proteinuria. That is again a pleiotropic effect. In a scleroderma crisis also, it can be a drug of choice. But main cause, main indication is congestive heart failure, ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, post-MI, diabetes mellitus, and even in a case of a CKD. In all these conditions, it is a drug of choice. Contraindication. It produces a major side effects like postural hypertension, absolute contraindication in pregnancy, absolute contraindication in CKD if it is less than, GFR is less than 30, and also in a case of AKI, 100% contraindication. Relative contraindication, if a person is getting a chronic cough, which is because of ACE inhibitor, you will have to stop and switch over to ARB or another drug. Don't combine ACE inhibitor with potassium sparing diuretic like trimeterin or what we call as potassium sparing diuretics, amyloride. In those particular compounds, you don't try to combine. Also, as far as possible, don't combine ACE inhibitor with aldectone or we call spironolactone. By and large, don't use in a peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease. In this also, you should not use. There is one major drawback. Because a person who is having an ACE inhibitor can develop angioedema and sometimes this can be life threatening. Enalapril, you can go from 5 mg to 40 mg. Being a short acting, you will have to give BID. Lisinopril is a long acting. Again, dose can be from 2.5 mg to 40 mg. The dose is usually OD. Remipril is again long acting. You can give 1.25 mg to 20 mg OD. Good number of time it is given at the bad time. All these are not potent antihypertensive. So, depending upon the requirement, you can go to those particular doses. These are all marked out. You can go through at leisure time. ARB, same thing. Only I am talking regarding a drug. There are losartan, telmisartan, olmisartan, and azilsartan. Losartan, 25 to 100 milligrams, short acting, so you have to give BID doses. Telmisartan is 20 to 80 milligram OD dose. Almisartan 10 to 40 milligram because this is two times more powerful than Telmisartan. Also, Azilsartan is also two times more powerful than Telmisartan. So, they are also OD doses, but they are half the dose of Telmisartan. So, try to remember all this. There are other compounds like Valsartan, Candisartan, etc. These are, lot of trials are being done and they are found to be very effective. But because of the cost factor, the use is relatively little bit less. And they are utilized in a post-MI and ischemic heart disease group. So, these are the advantage of ARB, etc. And this is the advantage of a telmisartan. It has got a pleiotropic effect on what we call is a heart. It reduces the enlargement of the heart, means it helps in remodeling and also beneficial effect in a congestive heart failure. It has got a beneficial effect on a lipids. So, if a person is hyperlipidemic, it has got a pleiotropic effect. It has also got, got a pleiotropic effect on a visceral flag. On a protein urea is reduced. So, it helps in progression of a CKD and partial reversal of CKD. It also helps in reducing insulin resistance, redux, reduction in a HOMA index and reduction in a HbA1A1c. So, 
It is also helpful in diabetic mellitus. It has got an effect on decreasing uh, arterial stiffness. So it reduces the peripheral vascular resistance also. So this is also one additional pleiotropic effect. And also it has got the effect on PAPA A receptors. It is a partial activation. And it reduces blood pressure for 24 hours. So these are all the pleiotropic effects. So these are the benefits of ACE inhibitor, antiproteinuric, so protection in a kidney for reduction in a proteinuria. So it reduces the CKD possibility, regression of LVA, so we call remodeling. So it improves the survival of in a person with a heart failure. So again, it helps in remodeling, reduces the mortality. It is also useful in a graft survival. It reduces the complications which is induced by fibrosis. It also reduces the production of angiotensin 1 and also has got a benefit effect of angiotensin concentration which increases by angiotensin blockage. So these are all the beneficial effects. Now we come to the beta blocker. Beta blocker is a fourth drug of choice, but it is very, very beneficial in young individual, in adults, young adults, mitral valve prolapse, we call hokum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, in angina, or we call it a stable angina, it is a drug of choice. Also, if the person is hypertensive with ischemic heart disease, post MI, unstable angina, it is a drug of choice. In congestive heart failure, dissecting aorta or dissecting aortic aneurysm in that also it is a drug of choice in a person with anxiety also it is a drug of choice they say that a person who is having malaria beta blocker can be helpful in hyperthyroidism because the person is having hyper secretion during stress that is blocked by beta blocker so if a person is hypertensive with thyrotoxicosis, it is beneficial. With tachyarrhythmia, it is beneficial. In a pheochromocytoma, it can be given on, along with pentalamoin, etc. or phenoxabenzamine. So it is a second drug of choice in pheochromocytoma. In eclampsia, labetalol, which is an alpha-beta blocker, can be of a drug of choice in case of an eclampsia or hypertension during pregnancy. So these are all the indication where it becomes, instead of four, it can become first drug of choice. So use that. What is the contraindication? Bread, severe bradycardia, complete heart block, sick sinus syndrome, first degree AV block, second degree AV block. It should not be combined with diltiazime and verapamil. These are the major contraindication. Relative contraindication in old age person, type 2 diabetes, where it can block the effect of hypoglycemia in a person. In a person with peripheral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, Reynolds phenomena, relative contraindication. So these are the relative contraindication, these two. These are absolute contraindication. By and large, don't use if a person is having libido or if a person is having COPD or asthma. But even in these cases also, nowadays they are being used because we have got a selective beta blockers. It can increase lethargy. It can worsen left ventricular failure or cardiogenic shock. So in this group also, sometimes it is not utilized. So these are there. Etanolol is very powerful. You will have to give 25 milligram to maximum 100 milligram. It is a long acting, so you can give OD or BID doses. Metaprolol is available in a sustained release preparation or extended release preparation. So you can utilize from 12.5 milligram to 100 milligram depending upon the indications. Now this is the drug which is most commonly utilized being a beta selective broker. Bisoprolol is very, very powerful. It is 2.5 milligram to maximum 10 milligram and it is a long acting drug. So it is a OD dose. So these are the common drugs which are, the th these are the three common drugs. There are other drugs like carvedilol, nevedilol, which are utilized mainly in case of ischemic heart disease, post-MI, etc. and for remodeling purposes. So in those conditions, 
you can use carvedilol nevedilol and labetalol is utilized in a person we call during pregnancy and in case of emergency in a injectable form so these are all the conditions where you utilize and i'll show you in a next slide combined together how this beta blocker is effective and it is a first drug of choice it is a first drug of choice if a person has got ischemic heart disease with hypertension congestive heart failure with hypertension stable angina unstable angina with hypertension acute mi with hypertension tachyarrhythmias for remodeling purposes and if a person is hypertensive it is the first drug of choice so remember all this these are all cardiovascular all cardiovascular conditions so if you get cardiovascular condition say in unstable angina for plaque stabilization also beta blocker becomes a drug of choice now we go to an another compound we call it a calcium channel blocker they are divided into different generation first generation second generation third generation fourth generation first generation is nifedipine second generation is nicardipine and felodipine third generation is amlodipine and fourth generation is selenodipine this selenodipine is effective on l receptor and t receptors which are present in glomerulus and that helps in reducing intraglomerular pressure but these are not powerful blood pressure drugs they reduce his blood pressure mildly there are some drugs which we call as this group diltiazime and verapamil this particular drugs are mainly utilized for tachyarrhythmias so we divide into two big groups vasodilators and cardio specific these are more cardio specific means they are utilized for what we call as cardiac arrhythmias tachyarrhythmias while these are what we call is a vasodilators they are more vasodilator than cardio specific but all this condition they produce is vasodilatation and because of vasodilatation fall of blood pressure and they produce reflex tachycardia so in a person with tachycardia avoid using these drugs we call second generation first generation third generation and fourth generation these are ccb which are not put into dihydropyridine groups so dihydropyridine groups is first second and third generation and fourth generation and non dihydropyridine groups is utilized mainly for cardiac arrhythmias this particular may have a pleiotropic effects what we call is a fourth generation and these are the drugs which are mainly utilized for supraventricular tachyarrhythmias not for ventricular arrhythmias and for ischemic heart disease group well these are mainly utilized in a person with ckd peripheral arterial disease and isolated systolic hypertension again i am repeating this group nifedipine nicardipine amlodipine selenodipine for isolated systolic hypertension or we call old individual peripheral arterial disease and ckd this is a drug of choice in this group so first generation second generation third first generation nifedipine second generation nicardipine third generation amlodipine and azaldipine and fourth generation is selenodipine now these are acting on l receptors these are acting on l and n receptor also so depending upon that it reduces the heart rate these are all those which reduces the heart rate well this will decrease the elevated heart rate also this will produce tachyarrhythmias tachycardias so they should be avoided in a person who are having tachycardia so benedipine and selenodipine will be usually a drug of choice in case of a ccb nowadays azelnadipine is in a market which is having a effect on l as well as a t receptor which is also reducing the heart rate and there is another compound called ephenodipine azelnadipine and benedipine so combining together i have already told you that it is a drug of choice in a old individual ckd aki pregnancy during pregnancy also it is a second drug of choice after labetalol 
in case of atrial flutter fibrillation diltiazem and verapamil is a drug of choice because these are supraventricular tachyarrhythmias nifedipine can be utilized in a hypertensive crisis but this is outdated now in a person with a bradycardia you can use amlodipine and nifedipine in hypertensive crisis particularly with pheochromocytoma dicardipine is a drug of choice in case of eclampsia and preeclampsia after labetalol amlodipine and nifedipine is a drug of choice don't use ccb in a person with tachyarrhythmias particularly amlodipine and nifedipine they are usually not utilized in a congestive heart failure and ischemic heart disease diltiazem and verapamil is not utilized in bradycardia and they are not combined with beta blockers a person if he develops an ankle edema because of amlodipine change it over to the s amlodipine or we call chirally form amlodipine or you can change over to other compounds like we call as silnadipine third generation and fourth generation groups some person also develops an another complication we call as a gum hypertrophy which is a complication which usually is detected very frequently by a dentist and by stopping calcium channel blocker gum hypertrophy will reverse back so that is one of the another contraindication for ccb amlodipine is a long acting drugs so usually od right from 2.5 mg maximum 20 higher the dose the chances of ankle edema gum hypertrophy tachycardias etc are more common so take care of that nifedipine is a short acting drugs sustained release preparation can be utilized as a od or bid doses and dose maximum is 60 mg nicardipine maximum dose is 120 mg from 10 to 120 mg usually od dose or sometime it is given in a split up dose like bid felodepine is a more vasodilator 2.5 to 20 mg so it is a drug of choice in a case of a, where you want a peripheral vasodilation dilatation diltiazem is mainly diltiazem and verapamil diltiazem from 90 mg to 240 they go even up to 480 mg in a selective cases and where the facilities are available for what we call is an icu verapamil you can go up to 360 mg and this can be utilized also in a injectable form in a case of a supraventricular tachycardia with unstable unstable hypotension so in that particular group now azelnadipine dose is 8 mg to maximum 16 mg od dose and silnadipine is from 10 mg to 20 mg even sometime we go up to 40 mg so these are all the conditions where ccb is utilized indication and contraindications now we come to diuretics in diuretic we have got a thiazide diuretic we have got a loop diuretic and we have got potassium sparing diuretic by and large the maximum diuretic which are being utilized is a loop diuretics which can be prusamide which can be torsamide which can be chlorthalidone so commonest diuretic which is utilized is chlorthalidone which has got an advantage above hydrochlorothiazide hydrochlorothiazide can be utilized from 6.5 25 to maximum 50 mg higher the dose the chances of hyperuricemia hypertriglyceridemia and hyperglycemia is more hence hydrochlorothiazide should be utilized in a lower doses so to want a therapeutic effect you will have to go up to 50 mg so by because of this reason slowly hydrochlorothiazide is almost out of market prusamide and torsamide is mainly utilized in a person in a hypertension with congestive heart failure rather than pure hypertension hence in a pure hypertension chlorthalidone is a drug of choice usually it is combined with ace inhibitor or it is combined with beta blocker or it is combined with ccb depending upon what is the requirement and maximum dose is 12.5 mg and again repeating prusamide and torsamide is a drug of choice in a person with congestive heart failure so potassium sparing diuretics are not commonly utilized for hypertension they are mainly utilized in with along with other drugs so there are three drugs spironolactone amiloride and trimetoprim 
Spironol lectin is very frequently combined with prosamide or with torsamide, and that is utilized in a person who is having hyperaldosteronism, particularly in a congestive heart failure, ascites, etc. Very commonly in a person with ascites. So in this particular group, it is most commonly utilized in combination with torsamide or in combination with prosamide. So in that particular condition, it is a drug of choice. So it is combined with torsamide or it is combined with prosamide. But whenever you are using using this, always keep in mind whenever the potassium sparing diuretics are utilized, and if they are utilized along with ACE inhibitor. So if ACE inhibitor is given and diuretics are given, keep a watch for potassium. So that should be there. In any person who has got a volume overload, diuretic is a drug of choice. Hyperaldosteronism, spironolactone is a drug of choice. Hydrochlorothiazide dose usually is 6.25 to 50. Furosemide is 20 to 80 milligram. Sometimes in a person with a congestive heart failure, we go up to even double the dose, and even sometimes we give 80 milligram IV. Aldecton maximum dose is 200 milligram. but keep a watch on potassium contraindication of diuretic absolute contraindication aki ckd end stage renal disease and in a old age person more than 65 try to avoid because excessive use of diuretic will produce postural hypotension and it is absolutely contraindicated in aki ckd and end stage renal failure as some of the diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide increases uric acid increases lipids and increases sugar it is contraindicated in diabetes gout and also in a hyperlipidemia and this diuretic potassium sparing diuretic should not be combined with ace inhibitor or arb and they are contraindicated in a person with hyperkalemia because of prosamide and torsamide it can produce hypokalemia hyponatremia while potassium sparing will produce hyperkalemia and this use of larger dose can produce orthostatic hypotension there are additional advantage of diuretic in this condition i am keeping this slide for a second have a pause go through that it is helpful in heart failure hypertension severe edema pulmonary edema acute renal failure we give a booster dose or we call therapeutic dose hypercalcemia hyponatremia calcium nephrolithiasis nephrogenic diabetes insipidus lidl syndromes lithium induced diabetes insipidus primary hyperaldosteronism edema of pulmonary hypertension or portal hypertension sorry portal hypertension liver cirrhosis also in case of epilepsy acute mountain sickness raised intracranial pressure glaucoma metabolic alkalosis nephrotic syndrome aki ckd cystinuria ascites portal hypertension hyperkalemia hypokalemia poisoning etc these are a big list some other time we'll go through the chapter on diuretics so it in that particular i am giving a little advantage of a chlorothalidone it is having an advantage of diuretic plus we call pleiotropic effect so it is helpful in hypertension congestive heart failure diabetes with hypertension in a metabolic syndrome isolated systolic hypertension and it can be utilized safely in a person elderly person it has got a cardio protection by reducing the congestive heart failure it reduces lvh also helpful in ischemic heart disease cerebrovascular disease it is also having a pleiotropic effect on antiplatelet angiogenesis vascular permeability hence it is benefited in a congestive heart failure now we are talking about alpha adrenergic blockers alpha adrenergic blockers they are very very helpful in certain conditions but they are not the first drug of choice they should be utilized in a person in a secondary line of treatment that is it is always as a add on therapy it is added if a person is having hypertension with bph or person is having a resistant hypertension or person is having hypertension with diabetes mellitus with hyperlipidemia so minipress is a drug of choice minipress is very beneficial in bph 
and if a person is having hypertension it will be a drug of choice but major contraindication bpig is very common in old age and in a old age it produces postural hypertension or orthostatic hypertension so whenever you use in a bpf do take care of postural hypertension non selective adrenergic blocker because they are non selective they act at a multiple receptors it is a drug of choice in a pheochromocytoma in a pheochromocytoma the first drug either pentolamine or phenoxybenzamine is given iv after the person is stabilized you add on other drugs like calcium channel blocker or beta blockers but whenever you use this drug in a pheochromocytoma keep a watch on postural hypertension so in a pheochromocytoma the first drug of choice is pentolamine or phenoxybenzamine and by and large the pentolamine is the common drug which is being utilized and keep a watch whenever you utilize this drug of postural hypertension we come to another group we call as a centrally acting drugs that is what we call as drug which is acting at the level of hypothalamus and autonomic nervous system area and that particular drug is methyl dopa clonidine and moxclonidine these are the three drugs methyl dopa is a drug of choice during pregnancy in eclampsia and preeclampsia but because of good number of side effects hepatotoxicity hypotension etc this drug is not commonly utilized clonidine is a add on therapy as a fifth drug four drug fifth drugs maximum dose is 0.6 mg and it is commonly utilized in the bid doses tid doses moxclonidine will not have a rebound hypertension but it is not as powerful as clonidine so clonidine is still a drug of choice only drawback is rebound hypertension in clonidine while both of this clonidine and methyl dopa will produce postural hypertension while moxclonidine is having less incidence of orthostatic hypertension and rebound hypertension so in a person in whom you want to give centrally acting drugs but you don't want to have this side effects and if a person is getting rebound hypertension or orthostatic hypertension give moxclonidine and maximum dose of moxclonidine is 0.6 mg od dose so that is the dose and it is mainly utilized as a add on therapy in a case of preeclampsia eclampsia and add on therapy in a patient with a resistant hypertension in a pheochromocytoma clonidine can be utilized as a in a clonidine test but be very careful while you use clonidine in a pheochromocytoma because it can be dangerous sometime so it should be tried only in presence of an icu facilities there are alpha beta blockers the most common alpha beta blocker we utilize is labetalol and it is utilized in a preeclampsia and eclampsia maximum dose is 800 mg and you can split up that dose into bid dose why contraindication is only bradycardia and postural hypertension which are not very common carvedilol and nevedilol they are mainly utilized in a person hypertension with ischemic heart disease and mainly post mi groups and carvedilol you can go up to 50 mg and nevedilol you can go up to 10 mg and these are the drugs which are commonly utilized where you do not utilize the other beta blockers that is metoprolol in those cases you can add carvedilol in other antihypertensive drugs or for remodeling or we call as a post mi so these are all the different types of drugs what are available for hypertension now this group we call as a vasodilator group miscellaneous group minoxidil hydralazine and disoxide and nitroprusside nitroprusside and hydralazine are the most common drugs which are utilized for hypertensive crisis and particularly in a case of a hypertensive emergency they are available in the form of injectables but nitroprusside is less commonly utilized hydralazine is the most commonly utilized but now because of the availability of injectable nitroglycerin which is available so whenever you use iv nitroglycerin 
these drugs are almost not commonly utilized. So they are usually most commonly utilized in a hypertensive crisis, particularly hypertensive emergency. In that case, it is given in an injectable form. Very rarely they are utilized for resistant hypertension. The common drawbacks is postural hypertension. Don't use this vasodilator in a person who is having a carotid artery stenosis, renal artery stenosis, and cerebrovascular disorders. In this group, it will produce what we call as a still syndromes. And the organs which is having stenosis will be damaged, like brain and kidney. And these are the doses which are being utilized. Nowadays, the nitroprusside is very rarely utilized. The common utilization is hydroxyl, hydralazine, and much commoner is IV nitroglycerin, NG we call, short form we call as NG. So that is most commonly utilized. Now, this is a comparison of all the drugs and the side effects. So what are the side effects and which condition you utilize? So in an ischemic heart disease, the commonest drug which is utilized is beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. In LVH and LVF, diuretic is the first drug of choice. Second drug of choice is the beta blockers. Third drug of choice is the ACE inhibitor. While calcium channel blockers are usually not utilized. In cerebrovascular mortality, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker and diuretics are the drug of choice. While calcium channel blocker usually is contraindicated. In a person with a tachycardia, usually calcium channel blocker will produce tachycardia, while beta blocker will produce bradycardia. So it will be contraindicated in presence of bradycardia. Calcium channel blocker will be contraindicated in tachycardia. In diabetes, the first drug of choice is ACE inhibitor, while you don't utilize diuretic, beta blocker, and calcium channel blocker in diabetes. As far as the lipid is concerned, again, ERB is having a pleiotropic effect particularly ARB groups is having a pleiotropic effect. So they are better in that particular while diuretics, particularly hydrochlorothiazide and beta blocker that is etanolol is having hyperlipidemia as a side effects should not be utilized. While calcium channel blocker is neutral. Fluid and sodium and water retention. Sodium and water retention is more common with what we call as beta blockers and certain calcium channel blockers because of vasodilatory effects. So in those particular condition, don't use this particular groups. Is that clear? This produces vasoconstriction. Why? Diuretic will have a positive effect. So in a person with a left ventricular failure, congestive heart failure, it is a drug of choice. What we call as a potassium excess, hyperkalemia, Certain diuretics, particularly potassium sparing diuretics should not be utilized and beta blocker will produce bronchospasm. So it should, be, should not be utilized in a person with COPD and bronchial asthma. While calcium channel blocker is a neutral. So you can utilize that. Now ACE inhibitor will produce cough. So it should not be utilized in a person who gets a cough. We call urine analysis. Unstable, sorry, not urine analysis, unstable angina and conductive dip. Very odd things which is mentioned. So we call conduction. So unstable angina and conduction. Particularly beta blocker will reduce the conduction and will produce a bradycardia. So should not be utilized in a first degree AV block, second degree AV block, complete heart block. Also in a person with a sick sinus syndrome, etc. should not be utilized. Calcium channel blocker, particularly diltiazime and verapamil should not be utilized in a person with a beta blocker. Person who is already on beta blocker or person who is having a bradycardia should not be utilized. And diuretics, particularly hydrochlorothiazide which increases the uric acid, it should not be used in person who is having a hyperuricemia. Why? Losartan is a drug of choice in a person who is having hyperuricemia. So this is a combined slide. I am having another slide. This is a quiz for you. You can go at your leisure time. Which is a drug of choice in a renal artery stenosis? What is contraindicated? I put all this. 
so you can go through but have a genuine twist for you so go through these are all the conditions these are indications these are contraindication which drugs is contraindicated go at your leisure time i am skipping over yes this is what we call is a flow charts just go through at your leisure time if the person is having a blood pressure at this level start one agent if blood pressure is more than 160 100 start two lifestyle modification is common for both if person is having albuminuria what drug you will use if person is having no albuminuria you can use any one of this drug you can see this and then assess the blood pressure control for follow up if target is achieved continue the therapy if target is not achieved what you do everything is mentioned here so go through this we are going to utter all those things and a simplified manner we say that younger the individual first drug of choice is always a ace inhibitor arb older the individual ccb is a drug of choice as far as possible don't use diuretic if it is not controlled by ace inhibitor and diuretic or ace inhibitor you combine the second drug and second drug is usually calcium channel blocker or diuretics in younger individual ace inhibitor with diuretic in older individual ace inhibitor with calcium channel blocker if after that is not controlled use all the three ace inhibitor calcium channel blocker diuretic and even after this if it is not controlled in a full therapeutic dose of diuretic full therapeutic dose of ace inhibitor full therapeutic dose of calcium channel blocker if still not under control we label that as a resistant hypertension now you can add spironolactone or you can use epilerone and that will help you in a resistant hypertension as a fifth drug you can use a alpha blocker beta blocker or centrally acting drugs or you can use a vasodilators the most commonly utilized is alpha blockers or you can use a beta blocker or you can use a cell centrally acting drugs so any one of these drug you can utilize and this is a flow chart which is the simple most flow chart we can utilize and this is what we follow in india younger individual that is less than 55 years older individual they say that more than 55 so this is the common we follow in india so this is the base chart again go have a leisure time read properly and you can approach accordingly now this is individual if a person is uncomplicated whatever we have given here the same is repeated same is repeated right now this is follow up what we have told you in this this is in follow up that is highlighted here that is highlighted here you can go at your leisure time what you do in a follow up these are all we call as a compelling indication hypertensive crisis urgency or emergency coronary artery disease cerebrovascular stroke diabetes ckd heart failure plus others these are all compelling indication and depending upon the compelling indication the drug will choice i have selected this common compelling indication if the person has got lv dysfunction or person is having symptom signs of what we call as a failure signs diuretic is first drug of choice with ace inhibitor so this is the most common drug and combination which is prescribed the second drug which we will add not ccb 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 is contraindicated now beta blocker becomes a drug of choice so beta blocker ace inhibitor and diuretic becomes a drug of choice depending upon the indication you can use a ace inhibitor diuretic and beta blocker and add on therapy wise we add on arb you can add potassium sparing diuretic like aldosterone antagonist in post mi beta blocker becomes the first drug of choice ace inhibitor becomes the second drug of choice and you can add aldosterone as a add on therapy while coronary artery disease again beta blocker ace inhibitor and diuretic or ccb while in a diabetes ace inhibitor is the first drug of choice or arb and diuretic particularly hydrochlorothiazide should not be utilized in case of a diabetes mellitus also in case of what we call as hyperuricemia and hyperlipidemia 
and last drug in a case of a diabetes is beta blocker so beta blocker is contraindicated in diabetes mellitus while it is a drug of choice in a left ventricular failure post mi and coronary artery disease so remember this particular thing in a ckd ace inhibitor and arb can be utilized up to gfr 30 but less than 30 these are contraindicated and in that case ccb becomes the first drug of choice diuretic is contraindicated ace inhibitor is contraindicated so ccb and beta blocker remains in a recurrent stroke ace inhibitor is a drug of choice and you may combine with diuretic but in a old individual with postural hypotension diuretic should not be utilized so these are all the common compelling indication which you come across in your everyday practice i have taken that and in the next slide we are just going through what i have mentioned in a diabetes mellitus this is in a coronary artery disease drug of choice first second third drug of choice this is again first second third drug of choice in a person with left ventricular dysfunction ckd in atrial fibrillation what drugs are to be utilized so all this you can go through your red laser time so these are all called compelling indication hypertension with something which is present and this is combination of all those previous slide lvh microalbuminuria cerebrovascular strokes heart failure angina aortic aneurysm atrial fibrillation flutter end stage renal disease peripheral arterial disease isolated systolic hypertension metabolic syndrome diabetes pregnancy uh blocks etc so these are all those conditions you can undergo all these are the drug of choice at your laser time you can undergo now this is one simple things start with mono if not control go to poly means add on one so always use a small dose don't use a toxic dose larger the dose the toxicity is more you combine more and more toxic material you get more and more chance of toxicity poly you can use small small dose of multiple different agents which are acting at different different levels so you get the best effect and this is the way they say sorry so choose one agent from each group so small dose is chances of side effects are minimum and chances of toxicity are minimum this is the best way of combining so polytherapy is always better than monotherapy but initially in a grade 1 and early stage monotherapy is always better it is always said that never combine a with a that is ace inhibitor and arb should not be combined you can combine ace inhibitor with diuretic ace inhibitor with ccb ace inhibitor can be combined also with usually it is not combined with beta blocker not usually by and large not combined with beta blocker while diuretic you can combine with ccb you can combine with ace inhibitor you can combine with arb you can see a beta blocker beta blocker is in one corner you can combine dotted line with diuretics but by and large beta blocker is not combined with other as a drug of choice but it can be add on therapy with other and particularly in a person with ischemic heart disease acute mi congestive heart failure uh, post mi etc beta blocker unstable angina stable angina beta blocker becomes a drug of choice so go through this slide at your laser time again ace inhibitor and arb should not be combined always remember so this is that same a can be combined with d a can be combined with c c b is separate so it can combine with both this c can be combined with d c can be combined with a so that possibility is always there and beta blocker is indicated in angina post mi heart failure atrial fibrillation aortic aneurysm etc we have done in detail so these are all possible combination which are recommended two drugs combination these are three drug combination we call it a c and d c b is not there here also b is not there common b is very rarely combined with c c b but 
B is not a common combination. And beta blocker should not be, no combination. By and large, should not be combined with diuretic, except in a case of a heart failure. By and large, it, these two drugs should not be combined, ACE inhibitor and ARB. And you should not combine ACE inhibitor or ARB with what we call as a renin inhibitors. Renin inhibitors. You should not combine with those groups. So these are all those dual combination, triple combination, which are available in markets. Go through your at leisure times. And these are never combined. And these are some of the drugs which you utilize and don't utilize in pregnancy. Selective. So safe drug during pregnancy, hydralazine, methyl dopa, labetalol, etc. And calcium channel blocker. Avoid diuretics, propranolol, ACE inhibitor and sodium nitroprusside. This should be avoided. And these are never combined. We have already mentioned before. And some of the other combination which should be avoided. Go at your leisure time. These are all what we call as drugs which are of choice during pregnancy. Methyl dopa, labetalol, nifedipine and hydralazine. These are the drugs. And these are the adverse side effect. Because of the adverse side effect, methyl dopa is outdated. Labetalol and nifedipine is a drug of choice. These are what we call is a follow-up. In a follow-up, regular blood pressure checkup, weight control, weight control, have a checkup for sensation because of diabetes, HbA1c, triglyceride, cholesterol, LDL, HDL, lipid profiles, eye checkup, all this should be done. And this is what we call as sequential follow-up, what should be done. And if you don't do this, you will miss good number of time, mask hypertension, mask uncontrolled hypertension, etc. Resistant hypertension, pseudo-resistant hypertension you will make out and you will treat with the wrong drugs. Now we go to the step second. That is what we call as after treatment, suppose BP is controlled, you have to have a regular follow-up. But say BP monitoring you are doing and it is uncontrolled, what you do? First, always rule out that person is taking salt, salt restriction, reduce stress, stop NSAID, steroids, oral contraceptive pills. This is a must. And after all this, if still it is uncontrolled, add antihypertensive drugs. Now, in an antihypertensive drugs, look at whether person is adherent or is in changing the dose. Is he taking a proper dose? Have you given a proper dose? Have you used a proper combination? We have already shown you the slides of proper combination. Use all those possible things. And after these two things, now only you can add addition. Have a proper blood pressure monitoring, like ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Rule out labi, rule out mass, white coat, resistant hypertension, etc. And then do investigation for primary and secondary, rule out secondary cause. These are all the things which interferes with what we call as a BP control. So again, salt, stress, NSAID, steroid and oral contraceptive pills. Look at the dose properly. Look at the person is compliant or not. Look at the proper combination you have used or not. You have used the proper dose or not. With an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, find out whether it is labile, mass, white coat or resistant hypertension. By investigation, again reinvestigate and find out whether it is secondary or not. And then what we say that add on fourth drug, fifth drugs, sixth drugs, etc. Or you might go for renal denervation and treatment for secondary. And in case of secondary, some causes are reversible, which needs surgical intervention, so that can be done. So that is this, what we have uttered before. Try to identify it belongs to which group, whether it is control or not, controlled resistant hypertension, controlled hypertension, whether it is a refractory resistant hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension. Try to identify, go on stepping up the dose, go up to the fifth dose, and if blood pressure is controlled, less than 140-90, maintain it, have a regular follow. This is for secondary hypertension, how you approach and what are there. You can undergo 
and you can look at this slide at your leisure time. Just I'm putting this particular, any person who develops sudden shoot up of blood pressure, severe elevation of blood pressure, person is having labile hypertension, person who is regularly following your advice, is taking all precaution to prevent resistant hypertension and to prevent pseudo resistant hypertension, still he is hypertensive, there is a refractory hypertension, person is complaining of severe headache, very young individual, say a person is of a 20, 25 years age, person is having palpitation, diaphoresis, serum creatine is gradually getting elevated, person is having symptom signs of endocrine symptom metology, clinically the person is obese, there are stria, hirsutism, etc. There is a clinical evidence of metabolic syndromes or person is having obstructive sleep apnea, rule out secondary cause. And in this group, if you treat that basic etiology, it may be reversible. And this is that particular flow charts. Again, at your leisure time, go through. These are all the investigation which you can do, which are usually not done in a while identifying primary. We will have to do blood urea serum creatinine, go for KUB, IV urography. If creatinine is more than 3, don't go for IVU or IVP. Renal angiography, CT angio, MRI angio. Again, precaution if the creatinine is more than 2.5 to 3. They say some people say even 2, don't try to utter, do this. So there will be some restriction while doing renal angio, CT angio or MRI angio or IV urography. These are all where you use a dye and person can develop a dye induced acute kidney damage, AKI. You can go for a Doppler duplex and try to identify if there is any renal involvement or any abnormality in an adrenal gland. Do a renin level. Do a captopril renography. You can go for renal vein renin ratio. It is called RV, RVR ratio. All these are these are the diagnosis or disease you are suspecting clinically and they are the diagnostic test. Have a pause, go through your lizard time. And treatment wise, yes, TLC is necessary in all the cases, whether it is primary or secondary. You have used A, C, D and B. You have used centrally acting drugs. Still it is not under, coming under control and if the person has got secondary etiology, treat the basic cause. Usually, renal artery stenosis can be treated by stenting. If a person is having a odd etiology, you can have a carotid baroreceptor stimulation by what we call as a, there is an instrument called as a carotid baroreceptor stimulators. In a case of a resistance or uncontrolled hypertension, you can go for renal denervation. This is somewhat like the pacemaker and it stimulates the carotid baroreceptors. It is, you know, like a deep, vein, uh, deep brain stimulators. There is a pacemaker-like instrument which stimulates a carotid baroreceptor because one point is given at the carotid baroreceptors and that can be helpful in some person, not in all. Renal replacement therapy or we call renal transplant in a person with an end-stage renal disease. This is a diagram which is showing you. You can see that you can introduce an instrument and you can undergo what we call as a renal denervation. So this is a renal denervation which is being done. Here, in a renal artery stenosis, you introduce an instrument, dilate and put a stent. This is atheroembolization. You remove the embolus and you dilate this particular stenotic part and put a stent. While here, you put a wire, this probe, and you burn out all those sympathetic fiber which are supplying this renal artery. And that's why it is called renal denervation. It is a denervating of a sympathetic fibers. So you burn out those particular fiber by a radio frequency. Now, if a person comes with a hypertensive emergency, like systolic blood pressure 180, diastolic 110 and he is having either urgency or emergency. 
urgency you can go for oral drugs but if in case of a doubt use injectable but in case of emergency it is only parenteral and i have already told you in parenteral you will have to use certain drugs particularly what we call as iv hydrolyzing or you can go for nitroprusside nitroprusside is outdated now they use most commonly is ng we call as a nitroglycerin so most common drug utilized is nitroglycerin and second common drug is hydrolyzing so that is being utilized so if a person is having end organ damage hypertensive encephalopathy subarachnoid hemorrhage intracranial hemorrhage acute pulmonary edema aki dissecting aneurysm unstable angina acute mi in all these conditions or in a person with a severe eclampsia you will have to treat as an hypertensive emergency so that is hypertensive emergency even they add accelerated hypertension malignant hypertension or they combine this this terminology is now almost gone accelerated malignant hypertension that is gone and these are the different conditions what are the drug of choice see nitroglycerin nitroprusside nitroglycerin nitroprusside and in some labetalol nicardipine so depending upon what is the emergency what is the complications you can use and these drugs are contraindicated try to go through that at leisure time this is same first line alternative drug of choice these are how you give what is the side effects what special indications where you can use the drug wise sodium nitroprusside nicardipine the what we call the calcium channel blocker then phenylalanine nitroglycerin enalapril or hydrolyzing the commonest drug utilized is hydrolyzing nitroglycerin these are the two commonest drug and then comes sodium nitroprusside these are the three common drugs which are most commonly utilized labetalol is another drug which is available as a beta blocker which is utilized in hypertensive emergency rarely they utilize esmolalol and pentolamine pentolamine is a drug of choice in a person who is having pheochromocytoma now these are the things guidelines are evidence based yes evidence based you cannot ignore them they should be utilized there are lot of guidelines and every year some new guidelines comes meaning still we are not sure what is beneficial what is dangerous so what is the take home points guidelines are meant for guidance but it is not mandatory if i purchase one shoes it does not fit everyone so as a shoes does not fit the this coat also does not fit this also does not fit so one size does not fit all so one size fits most no definitely not does not fit all so what should be there new hypertensive guidelines one size fit most 100% no so most important part lower the blood pressure lower your risk what is that lower below 140 90 and depending upon the compelling indication lower it to 130 80 120 by 80 treat the patient and not the number and try to reduce the risk as much as possible and this will help you in reducing the mortality and morbidity now i have kept four or five different cases go through your laser time read properly make the diagnosis write down the management and communicate with me okay so this is case number 1 this is case number 2 i have labeled as case 1a this is a separate case this is a third case what is the possibility what you will do try to answer write down separately and give me that answer this is 2a what is the possibility what you will do uh, what is the diagnosis what are the further investigation you will go for this is last case so goodbye i think this will be helpful to you and i'll see you soon
and i think it will be helpful to all interns and all who are practicing